hello everybody. Welcome to the Transportation and Parking Commission meeting for uh, April 10th, 2018. Um, I'm calling this meeting to order and I want to announce that this meeting is being uh, videotaped and recorded. It's right back there and audio recorded. Thank you. <laughs> and it's right back there. Um, and uh, why don't we start by doing introductions rather than a roll call. My name is Jim Nash, I'm the Ward 3 City Councilor, and I am the Chair of the TPC. Jean Lee Shar, Ward 4 Councilor and Vice Chair. Dave Pomerantz, Director of Central Services. Alan Verson, Planning Board. Gary Hartwell, Citizen. Krista Grinnett, Citizen. Wayne Feiden, Planning and Sustainability. Donald Scallion, Director of Public Works. Rich Cooper, Citizen. Maggie Chan, DPW, Nancy Forrestal, Assistant City Collector. Beth Willard, I'm the substitute recorder for Beth Capilet. Jody Casper, Police Chief. Thank you everybody for being here today. Uh, next on the agenda is public comment. Um, and that's where, and if you could state your name and your address. Okay, my name is Betty Lynn Wolfson. I uh, presently live at 105 Fern but I'm here to speak about um, Oak Street, which is around the block from where um, I lived on Oak Street uh, up until a year ago, uh, for more than 20 years. And um, when I found out that you were having your meeting today, I wanted to come just to find out details about what's entailed the process to have um, traffic calming be possibly addressed on Oak Street. Oak Street is the thoroughfare for cross traffic. Um, it, uh, for those of you that might not know, Oak Street is the, uh, a one block long street that runs parallel to the bike path ending at Bridge Road um, right in the JFK neighborhood. Um, so I'm here today to, to let you know that Oak Street is a great neighborhood. It's a neighborhood that's in transition from many retired folks to becoming lots of families with lots of young children. Um, but regardless of that, the JFK students use Oak Street as their mode of when they get out of school. They don't use the bike path to cut across to get to um, neighborhoods um, south of, of JFK, they use Oak Street by the hordes. And um, having lived there for more than 25 years, I can say to you that much of the traffic on that road far exceeds any residential <laughs> speed limit. So my concern is um, that we have um, large amounts of traffic speeding with lots and lots of students cl in clusters of 5, 10, 15, sometimes more than 20, all up and down that street. Those of you that are um, might be familiar with Oak Street, it's a straightaway for most of the block, but at the end of the street where it ends at Bardwell, it makes a sharp left. So traffic entering on Oak Street enters coming in without an ability to see what is ahead. And I can't tell you how many, I can tell hundreds of kids I've spoken to over the years that I live there say, guys, we have a sidewalk. I know walking down the middle of the street is very free, but I care about you, I'm worried about your safety, and this is an accident waiting to happen. So whatever it takes, I know that um, what I have available to me is a form online that I can look up, up traffic, traffic calming but I'd like to ask you what would be entailed in terms of me perhaps getting signatures of folks that live in my neighborhood or whatever's necessary to get the uh, town to do uh, some research to see how much actual traffic is um, utilizing Oak Street um, and what speed that they, they use when they go down the street. And I can tell you, having lived there many, many years, they was by. 50, 50 miles an hour is not uncommon. I mean, just whipping by. 
and um, I stood on the sidewalk and like told people, slow down, you know, it's, it's scary. And the fact that there are more and more families with little kids, um, I think it's an issue that should be addressed, as well as the, the students from JFK. If, if there were ever an accident, it, it could be horrific. Is it because of the large number of students that use that street. So I hope that whoever the powers that be and make a decision on which neighborhoods, you know, get reviewed. I hope you all can look at Oak Street seriously as um, a neighborhood that's in need of some sort of traffic cop, whether it's speed bumps or um, some additional signage, whatever it takes, we really need to slow down the traffic. Thank you for hearing me out. I appreciate it. Well, thank you. And um, so there's two things I understand that you could do. You could mm -hmm. go to that application online mm -hmm. and start filling that out. The, the other thing I, I suggest is maybe also talking to the administrators at the school about educating the students for. I've done that already. Okay. Um, one of the assistant vice principal, I'm forgetting Scott's last name is now my neighbor on Fern Street. And um, he did a wonderful program a couple years back with his, the students at JFK. And they went in the neighborhood and were doing projects with, with the neighborhood community. And I got to talking to him. And I let him know my concerns. Um, for, and he, he said to me that he would talk to the powers that be at the school. But you know, that's, that is a, it could be addressed at the school as well. Mm -hmm. But the kids, I think things have been said to the students. It's just, I, I, when I shared this with other friends that I've had, they said, we all did the same thing. They, when, they, when they think about who they were in middle school, is my, I just spoke to someone today and she said, oh yeah, I did the exact same thing with all of my friends when I was in middle school. We had sidewalks, but we walked down the middle of the street. Because it's freeing, and it's controlling, and all the things that seventh and eighth graders love to have a chance to feel, even if it's just momentarily, but it's not safe, so. But I will definitely pull up the form. That's right, and it goes right into uh, the DPW staff, <coughs> okay. and then um, then uh, both uh, myself and Counselor Shara will be in the loop on it, okay. and we'll also get your ward counselor in the- Alyssa, is that right? Yeah, she'll be in the discussion as okay. well. Well, thank you so much. Thank sure. you for hearing me out. I appreciate it. Thank you for coming. And thank you for your work. All right. Um, do we have a motion to. What? Oh, yeah. Is there anybody else for public comment? All right. Thank you. Um, do we have a motion to approve the minutes from our previous meeting in, on February 13th? Move to approve minutes from February 13, 2018. Second. Um, any discussion? All in favor, say aye. 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 All right. Um, now it's that point where we get reports from departments and subcommittees. Who'd like to go first? Donna, do you want to go? Sure, I have some updates from the DPW. Um, so it is April and construction season is upon us again. Um, so we have some projects from last year that we're finishing up. Audubon Road, uh, we need to do the final paving. So we anticipate that that work will be complete in, uh, towards the end of this month. Day Avenue, um, again, final roadway paving. Um, we're looking at probably later this month or early May. Uh, Holyoke Street remains closed to through traffic, final paving. Uh, is going to be late April or early May. There's also some utility work going on down there right now, um, the power company. Uh, Hinkley Street, um, the contractor has remobilized. We're doing water main work, sewer work, um, and uh, also complete roadway reconstruction. So that's going to run right through the entire summer on Hinkley Street. Um, traffic signal upgrades, one of our capital projects from last year that is starting to gain some momentum now is uh, upgraded traffic controls at the intersection of Bridge Road and Jackson Street. We've selected personnel <coughs> to design those controls, so they're starting that process. Um, I also uh, submitted a pavement memo to the mayor for fiscal year 2019 projects that's posted on the city website if anyone's interested in reading it. 
Um, we anticipate repaving this upcoming construction season sections of Pleasant Street, Hampton Avenue, Chesterfield Road, Wright Avenue, Fulton Ave, um, and Burt's Pit Road. Um, Burt's Pit Road is going to require some engineering due to uh, stormwater um, improvements that need to be made, and the permitting process might stretch sections of that into next construction season, um, depending on how quickly we can get the permits in place. Um, but it's a very aggressive um, paving schedule and uh, quite a bit of money that, that we'll be putting into roadway reconstruction. Um, so we are currently pre preparing the uh, bid documents and uh, should, should have that up to bid uh, shortly. Um, just a couple of other things. Um, we received some correspondence from concerned citizens about the signal at uh, Old South Street and Main Street um, and uh, the fact that there, there are often conflicts with pedestrians in the crosswalk as cars are trying to turn from Main Street onto um, onto the road, onto Old South Street. Um, and so what we have done is we've implemented what's called a leading pedestrian interval, or also known as an LPI. It's something that we did at Bedford Terrace and Elm Street intersection. And what it does, uh, it, to kind of boil it down to its essence, it, it gives pedestrians a head start. And the idea is we want to sort of hold the traffic and allow the pedestrians to get out into the crosswalk and that increases visibility. So you don't want to turn the light green and then have a pedestrian step off the sidewalk like sort of simultaneously um, because that can um, obviously create conflict. So what we're doing is we're giving pedestrians a three second head start um, to get across the roadway. So anyway, I was, I was on my way down uh, downtown here um, and I had a meeting just before this one and it's, I, I actually saw it in working and the, the results, I was very pleased with what I saw. It actually got the pedestrians, you know, off the sidewalk and they had pretty much cleared the intersection by the time the light turned green and people could turn. Um, so it, it's part of, it, so that like that's a nice sort of stopgap improvement. Um, but additionally, Mass DOT has, has hired GPI, which is a, a design firm, um, the design engineering firm to implement traffic signal upgrades along Route 9 between Northampton and Amherst, and this is part of the uh, PDTA project. Um, so one of the things that we'd be looking at is for GPI to further look at this intersection and recommend changes over and above the measures we've just implemented. But um, pay attention to that intersection next time you go through there, and, and I think you'll see an improvement. That's it. Thank you. Any questions? Are there any other reports? I have a couple of things. Um, so just the uh, bike ped committee met two weeks ago, endorsed the open space plan. I'm sure I'll be talking about a couple of minutes before you guys, but they're recommending you endorse it. And then uh, just three quick updates for planning office. We opened bids on uh, Wednesday of this week for the sidewalk improvements in City Hall campus which will include a, curb, a sidewalk curb extension to shorten the crossing distance across Main Street on this side of the street. Uh, we expect work to begin that in the middle of May. Um, we're going through, we're going to board in the contract now. Uh, and then related to so this, this work takes place on, includes the curb extension on this side of the street. Um, we have a public forum on Tuesday the 17th, so next Tuesday at 7 o'clock in the hearing room on the Cracker Barrel Alley project. This is a project with a lot of support for sort of making it into a park, but it's a lot of opposition from some of the businesses who are trying to do a big stakeholder meeting. But that might or may not include closing the alley, making it into a park, doing a curb extension, doing nothing. That's what the forums have um, And then finally, the, the bike share program. We're supposed to start open bike share somewhere around the first week or second week in June. You're going to start seeing the bike share station showing up in pieces. The first part sort of hidden, but you may have seen uh, Jim Malo around there doing some of the electrical work, so we're not having poured the pads yet, but the electricity is ready. So see that next month and a half. Yeah. So we'll start seeing the different stations and we when start will all the concrete. Stations? So the actual, so we have to set up the, co the electricity in the concrete, right. or asphalt in some cases, and then the vendor themselves start coming by middle of May for actual installing the infrastructure on top. <coughs> So by June, we'll start seeing bikes around town? Or? Yeah, we still work on the exact rollout, mm -hmm. uh, but first by the end of the summer. 
Well, by the middle of June, the system will be open. Not all stations will be open. Like, clearly Dickinson Hospital and the high school right. are still considering requests for the station, and they're going to lag. State Street requires a new phone pole, so it's going to lag. But, you know, nine or ten of the stations in Northampton should be open. Thank you. Um, any other reports? All right. Uh, the um, first thing on our agenda here is presentation on the multi-use trail plan. So I have a, you have a brief excerpt for this. Um, so I have 30 slides to talk about the entire open space plan. It could take like an hour, but I'm not going to do that. So just, just so it's clear. But, so this is the, our open space recreation and multi-use trail plan. It covers all those things. The part that I'm asking you all to endorse as a board is just the multi-use trail plan section. So the rest, other forums we'll be talking about. I'm happy to questions if you want, but I'm going to focus on, on the plan itself. Um, so I think I just have four slides for this. So, you know, in, in the plan, we talk a lot about our successes, what's going on. on. On this chart, if you look in the bottom right, you can sort of see quickly, you know, how bike paths have taken off and starting. We did the we had one of the first bike paths in New England, the first bike path in Western Mass. Five years ago, and then not much happened. And starting about six or seven years ago, we started to dramatically improve the system, and then we've been doing some off ramps and expanding the system since then. So the system continues to grow. Obviously, the tunnel was this year, the Jackson Street off ramp was two years ago, so we've been doing some things. So the system keeps growing. Um, again, the <coughs> overall open space plan, I know you can't read this slide, but just you know, there's sort of this 12 big actions only one of which is multi-use plan, uh, multi-use trail plan related. Um, and so city councils will hear this all later, but they have to do it buying open space, you know, managing open space, building new recreation areas, you know, a host of other things that, that don't have to do with you. Um, and so in the multi-use trail plan, there's sort of four big categories that we're putting these together. Um, the first one is just generally thinking about bicycle infrastructure. We know this tipping point. The more you do bicycle infrastructure, the more it makes a city bicycle friendly. When Boston brought the hubway to Boston, which is now called the uh, Blue, or they, they changed the name to, um, they were very clear that the hubway was only part of the system. It's getting all these people on bikes, sort of built a political constituency for making more bicycle infrastructure improvements. And even though Boston's not the easiest city to bicycle around, if you ever did it 10 years ago, it's now you know a world difference it is. And so we're trying to focus on those things. The bike share program is part of that. We think the bike share program will be successful by its own right. Um, part of the reason we're doing electric bike or pedal assist bikes is to get a wider demographic out there, people who are riding. So that's part of it. Um, thinking about sort of how do bike lanes lead to bike trails um, and particularly thinking about cycle tracks. So sort of enhanced bike lanes that are, are physically separated. So we did our first 400 feet of cycle tracks on Pleasant Street, you know, more as a demonstration project than anything else. So bicycle lanes that are separated. DPW is working on the design on Southern Park King Street. It would just be another 500 feet of cycle tracks. So sort of thinking about how these things build into the process. For the sake of this plan, we're particularly interested in these things as they connect to multi-use trails. Um, and then generally thinking about bike repair stations and bike storage. We've change zoning, or city council changes zoning about a year and a half ago to require a lot more private bicycle storage, on, you know, as part of private projects. Um, we had just put new bike lockers right down next to the roundhouse that in the near future will be open to city hall employees. We've now put two bike repair stations out. So we're trying to expand that, that kind of thing. Um, the second category at the bottom left is sort of think about what are the major trail expansions which will happen over the next five to 20 years, right? Very long-term planning, but it's really important because whenever someone comes before us for a subdivision or a major project, we say, well, how does this fit in our master plan? How do we, we make sure we address that? So if any of you go up to um, Rocky Hill Co-Housing, for example, there's a bicycle path in the middle of the woods. It's only half a mile long, and it looks like it doesn't go anywhere. But that was when Rocky Hill came forward and Ice Pond came forward. That was part of our master plan, so we had them build that section of trail. We're now working on the connecting trails that will eventually connect those together. So 
the master plan is important so that as opportunities come forward, we build on them. But there are four basic trails we're looking at. Extend, so right now, the Mass Central Trail is either paved or trap rock up to about a third of a mile from the Williamsburg town line. We hope this summer to extend the gravel section up the Williamsburg town line. And Williamsburg is working on their section, so it should be paved all the way up to South Main Street in Williamsburg, and then sort of safely from there. So that's sort of shorter term. The Rocky Hill Greenway, which includes that section I talked about by Ice Pond, um, <coughs> to, to Pathways and Rocky Hill Co-housing, that we should be having a public hearing for the design of a bike path from Route 10 to Route 66, and that we expect to have a public hearing within a year, and we hope to build it in three years. Um, and then the rest going all the way out to Ryan Road School and that whole neighborhood there, we're moving forward slowly. City Council approved, the recent closed on a major acquisition of land that allows that to happen. So that's the long term to go out to that neighborhood. Um, Damon Road multi-use trail plan, so you know for um, federal fiscal year that begins in 2021, going into 2022 construction, the state is planning to rebuild Damon Road and it will include a multi-use trail from Bridge, well, from Bridge Street up to the state bike path should happen next year, or a year and a half. And then from the state bike path all the way up to River Run should happen <laughs> three years later. And then we have a much longer term plan to go all the way up to Elm Court and Hatfield. Um, again, that's the 20 year plan, but sort of thinking about that as it goes forward. Um, uh, so those are, sort of, those are the big projects, the, the big trail projects. We've also thought a lot about access so we used to measure bike paths and say how many people live within three quarters of a mile or a mile of a bike path. Those are the people with easy access. But we realize there's some places where it looks like there's easy access, we can't actually get there. So there's a section from downtown to King Street where there's only one access point, and it's actually not quite a legal access point, and the section that leads from the VA hospital all the way up to Mulberry Street where there's no access points. Um, and so we think, okay, we, we can't just have a path that has to serve neighborhoods. So this list is um, six big access ramps, some of which might be in the short term, some might be much longer term, that really open up the area. So Edwards Square, with this, you know, a, a informal gravel trail that comes off the path, we want to pay that and finish the right of way that connects the whole Ward 3 area. Um, Birds Pit Drummond, you see a lot of people running and walking on Burke's Pit Road, and right at the height of Drummond, the road's really narrow, there's a tight curve, it's not the safest place. We've looked at the land to the north of that, because we do sort of a bypass trail that connects to the rail trail that already goes to Village Hill. Um, we're looking where uh, hotel bridges and leaves, we love doing off-ramp from the bike path down there. This is very long-term, because at this point, hotel bridges are open, but the idea is if it's ever possible to make hotel bridge open to pedestrians and bicycles, it would be nice to do an access ramp from the, the trail down to it. Um, Florence Street, somewhere there's that section between Look Park's northerly entrance um, and Leeds Elementary School, somewhere in that section, trying to find a ramp for, for an off ramp. The easiest spot is by Look Park. We've actually designed it, the north entrance. Um, we have to figure out how to get across the gas station and connect the, the sidewalk network, but again, we serve that whole neighborhood. Um, Hebert Avenue, um, which well, the whole South Street neighborhood is very close to the bike path, but not quite accessible. So how do we use Hebert to connect to that neighborhood? Um, and then finally, Riverbank Road access. So this would be from the State Trail, either going underneath the Coolidge Bridge, where there's a little bit of dry land, to go up to Riverbank Road, or in the next two years, when the state builds a new roundabout by exit 19, <coughs> that roundabout's gonna almost make it to Riverbank Road, could we buy just that 50 foot section, 100 foot section, to let people you know, come from the sidewalk around the roundabout to get to Riverbank Road where it's lots of safe running. So those are some of the big projects. And then there's a bunch of areas where we could do easy trails. So Blackberry is the most obvious. Blackberry Lane ends 80 feet or so from the bike path. It's perfectly flat. Just paving that section gives people an easy way to Jackson Street School. There's a bunch of other roads that get close to the trail. Um, we need more neighborhood meetings to figure out what those spots are. The plan is not gonna go so much in the weeds. The plan is to say we should look at more access points, um, but where exactly those would be would be based on, on future average. Um, so that's my statement. Okay. Thank you. And I'd love an endorsement both for you guys to endorse it. So just you know, the legal process is the planning board adopts the plan. Um, 
but we try to get as many board endorsements as possible because frankly it helps us get a future grant money. Right? So the plan doesn't mean much unless we can get grants to fund it. So your endorsement of this section, cons, cons for open space, recreations for public <coughs> should also add to that story. Okay. Any questions for Wayne? Wow. Okay. Um, would somebody like to make a motion for a positive recommendation? So moved. Second. Okay. Uh, any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any no's? Any abstentions? Right. It sounds like it was unanimous. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Wayne. Thank you. Um, so, uh, the next thing up is Chief Casper speaking about the intersection at Maple and Pine, and I know we have somebody from the public here who wants to hear about that. And then down at number letter E here, we have uh, the Hatfield traffic calming application, which I'd like to move up and do right after that because we also have somebody from the public here who would like to hear. So uh, why don't we start with uh, Chief Casper and Maple and Pine. So Maple and Pine is a four-way intersection up in Florence, uh, and it's uh, an intersection that we get frequent complaints about. We get a lot of reports of almost accidents, and then we also have a fair number of regular accidents. So I just wanted to bring it to the commission's attention. I looked at it a little bit myself, just did my own independent accident study, and determined that we've had 26 accidents there in the last five years. In 2017, we had 10 accidents at that one intersection. So the, the layout of the intersection, if you don't know it, is there's a, a straight road with no stop sign on it, and then um, Maple Street crosses over it, and it has stop signs going you know, both directions over Pine. Uh, so when I further broke down those accidents, I was curious uh, what, what was going to be the contributing factor here. They're kind of interesting accidents in the sense that um, the road that goes through that, that doesn't have the stop signs on it, there's a hill on one side that goes down to Nanato Street. So I assumed that perhaps cars were waiting at that stop sign and then missing a car that was maybe coming up that hill. So they turn right and look, don't see the car, and proceed and then get hit. That actually was not the case. Actually, it was about an equal number of vehicles um, going in either direction. They were getting hit equally from both sides. So it didn't seem like it was an issue of, of not seeing cars coming up the hill. Uh, they were 96 percent of them were two car accidents they're all the same they're not like they're all just pulling out in the intersection and getting hit um, so interestingly i thought uh, 23 percent of the drivers uh, just didn't stop for the stop sign so that could be an issue that we might be able to resolve with some improved signage and then 23 percent of the drivers also uh, they stopped but they thought it was a four-way intersection so just the just that which is almost half the accident seems like we could make a, a small change just with signage that would uh, have an impact on this intersection um, all the accidents occur during the day too between seven and seven so this is our regular commuter traffic there's not it's not a drunk driving problem intersection it's not nighttime it's just uh, our daytime traffic moving through it so i really just want to bring it to the attention of the commission in the hopes that i don't know if there's discussion on it or if um, the dpw <coughs> take a look at the intersection and do perhaps a more in-depth study than what I've conducted here in my, <laughs> in my looking at it. But it seems like there's pretty clear uh, issues with signage. Um, if, if you'd be willing to send us that data, that would be great. And we can, um, we can look at signage, we can also look like, we can also look at how the roadway is striped, mm -hmm. if at all. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll get that too. Great. Thank you. Yep. Just a, go ahead. Uh, um, are, are none of the accidents from Man Terrace, or does that sort of play into it? That they're not. Okay. Yep. I know that it's a weird intersection that it's technically a four way, but there's this odd Man Terrace that comes into the kind of into the four way just before the four way, but there's not a lot of traffic there, honestly, and then the traffic coming off there doesn't seem to be causing any, it's not having an impact on these accidents. Just curious, do we have any traffic data over time? Have you ever done any vehicle counts? If there's an increase in volume of traffic, you know, people are just wanting more traffic, more cars, more speed. Uh, just, I guess, a question for you, Donna. If we've ever done any sort of a look see in that area. I don't, if we have, it was more than two or three years ago. So if we, we need to look again. What is the process of doing a four-way stop? And then you 
any place in the city? Is it just an ordinance or um, how do you come out with I think the DPW, it, yeah, there's, there's certain criteria that need to be met. Um, the first <coughs> criteria relate to the volume um, of cars in all directions, as well as the crash data. Um, but from the sounds of it, the crash, you know, the, the number of crashes um, would certainly uh, dictate that they need to look closely at this. I know one of the concerns is that hills, the hill coming up. Maggie and I have talked about it in the winter time. Like if a car stops there, we don't want to leave cars stopped on a hill and then they can't start and the snow would keep moving and then we'll have accidents of people sliding backwards. Can I say one bit more context? So I don't know to what extent it's true, but we've had a number of people from Pine Street on the south side complain about people driving their neighborhood going really fast, keying cars when they, they left cars out to slow down the speed of traffic. Um, and so I don't know if, I mean, I, Deal with the intersection is great, but it may be we need to look at sort of a broader context piece as well if there's a problem elsewhere. Is there any accident data to suggest that there might be a broader problem here? Um, regarding the speeding, no. I mean, mostly it's, as I said, people not stopping for the sign, which I don't think is related to speed, or people stopping and then pulling forward, which is not speed related either. Not to say that there may not be, there could easily be speeding issues on the road. That's not a road that we, we get a lot of complaints about, um, but we do get calls on this intersection for near misses as well, so. Okay. The other end of Pine Street, I live on South Main Street, where it comes in there, and there's a lot of issues of people not stopping the war. Um, they, they look to the right down South Main Street, pull out, there's somebody coming around from, from Route 9. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a, that's a dangerous spot there, too. And where is it? Pine and where? Pine and South Main, where right at Trinity Road Park. Right, okay. Well, it looks like DPW has some things to look into. So you'll look into this intersection? We will, we'll report out. Okay. Once we've been able to take a look at the data. Thank you. Right, uh, just real quick, thank you for doing that. I live at that intersection, so I've seen a ton of accidents, so thank you. Mm -hmm. Do you have anything else to say? I, I'm sorry. I no, it's okay. That was it. Like, I was just kind of, I had emailed about it because I started working remotely, so I saw like two accidents in two months and was like, huh, it's kind of weird. So, but you pretty much decided it off, so thank you. And your name is? I'm Becky Francis. Thank you, Becky. And thanks for bringing it to our attention. It was already done. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> this is the way it always happens here. <laughs> All right. Uh, so thank you. Uh, next up is I'd like to move the Hatfield Street Commoning Application Review. Um, bring that up for discussion. And is that you done? Yep. Okay. So I'll provide some history and then discuss what DPW's recommendation is <coughs> based on um, what's happening uh, on North King Street and Hatfield Street. So in July 2015, an application was submitted to the TPC, um, and residents were concerned with high speeds and pedestrian safety. So in July 2016, DPW installed traffic counters um, at the end of July, and we put them down for seven days, which is our typical practice. And we saw that the average daily traffic was 6,548 vehicles. Um, the truck volumes were 0.7 to 1.2% of that total overall vehicle number. And the 85th percentile speed ranged from 34 to 36 miles an hour. It's posted at 30 miles an hour. So when we looked at this, we have to consider that uh, there's a significant uh, project that MassDOT is undertaking uh, for North King and Hatfield Street, um, and it, that's going to be the uh, construction of a roundabout at that intersection. It's kind of a weird intersection. It's like a um, it, it's, it's like a bad angle, so there's a very difficult visibility there um, in trying to pull from Hatfield Street onto North King um, and. Of course, traffic is traveling at very high speed down North King Street. Um, so as, as part of this proposed roundabout, um, there are several pedestrian improvements that are also proposed. 
Um, so I'm just going to kind of hit the high points of what those are. Um, where we're closing into 75% design on this. Um, so the, the project is really taking shape and it's, it's a very real project. Um, so again, we have to consider you know, what these improvements might look like and then try to figure out what our recommendations should be based on what these improvements might look at. So the, the roundabout project proposes a new sidewalk on the east side of Hatfield Street. So the sidewalk is going to stretch from North King Street to Cook Avenue, and that's going to connect to the existing sidewalk on Cook Avenue. Um, crosswalks are proposed at the intersection of Cook Avenue and at the Laurel Ridge Apartment Driveway. That's going to be a big block crosswalk, and then there's going to be one of those um, rectangular rapid flashing beacons installed, and that's pushed button activated, so it's like the flashing pedestrian lights that you see. Um, the, the project is slated for construction in 2019. Now, again, this is like a mass DOT project, you know, so that's, that's kind of their current timeline. It's certainly um, subject to change, but it could also happen in 2019. So, um, you know, based on the fact that we're close to 75% design, I would say we're on schedule. Um, so as we do our review of these plans, we will see, as this starts to really take shape, we will you know, see what these improvements are and then comment upon them if it's appropriate. Um, so based on, you know, what we're looking at for pedestrian improvements as part of this larger project that fortunately the city doesn't have to pay for, which is really nice, um, we, we have a recommendation um, for what can be done in the meantime. And one of the things that has proven to be very effective um, is line striping. And a lot of times, just sort of a visual delineation of travel lanes can have a, 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 the effect of slowing traffic down. Um, so what we are recommending is the painting of white edge lines on Hatfield Street between Cook Ave and North King Street, where they don't currently exist. They, they currently end very close to that intersection. And what we're trying to do is delineate 11-foot travel lanes, um, which are typical with travel lanes, um, but which will narrow that roadway enough um, that evidence has shown that, that that can have an impact on speed. So that is the EPW's recommendation in light of the fact that this entire area is going to undergo significant reconstruction. And you know, when we do restrike this, you know, obviously like they're going to do sort of construction, you know, on top of what we do. So we're we're trying to do a. Um, you know, we're trying to sort of make a gesture to address the immediate need. Um, understanding that Mass DOT's project is going to sort of supersede anything that, that we do. And th so the striping will go from Cook Ave up to Bridge Road or? Up to North King. To North King. <clears throat> Does it already exist on the Hatfield side that goes to Bridge Road? Or? It, it comes. It comes up but does end um, after the intersection with Cook Road. So it extends out of that intersection, I don't know, like 100 feet maybe. Okay. And, and when I reviewed the, the application, there was also some sight line issues that were going on with the Cook Avenue intersection. And I think those have been resolved. There, I had to yeah. do with shrubs being in the way. Yeah. And they, they moved them back, the, the apartment buildings there were all Laurel Park, they did cut down their shrubs so we can see better. Which is great. And do we know what initiated that? Was it neighbors talking? Yeah, it was us. We called them. Okay. Yeah. I don't know if other people, I don't know if the city also contacted them, but they responded. How about we all take credit? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, um, yeah, I, I remember those shrubs were, in fact, that was a big part of the application was yeah. that Cars were traveling fast, but the sight lines were it's such, such a sharp corner there. Right. Like yeah. So, you want to see them the minute they get out from the buildings. So those okay. with those shrubs that now happens. gone, that those sight right. lines are better. Right. Okay. And the the addition of these uh, narrowing the travel lane should also help reduce right. speed a bit, along with that big project going in up on North King. So. Yeah. So what do we say? That's it, or you know, that, that's the the recommendation, or that's the DPW's recommendation. Okay. Mm -hmm. I think this is great. So one reason I think it's particularly important is, so um, even though it's listed as 2019, NASDOT agreed to do all the right of way for the for the roundabout, 
which is great for the city because we're not paying for it, but MassDOT isn't very fast about right, about right away. So a 2019 project means they have to advertise it by September 30th of 2019. So probably the most optimistic we're gonna get is 2020 construction. Mm -hmm. It can only go slower from that. So the, the lines become important because we're a couple of years away. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, and that's and that's why we're making this recommendation. You know, line striping, you know, certainly has a cost associated with it, but you know, it can be impactful for a reasonable right. amount of money. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Um, so, did we only measure speed from North King to Cook, right? Not from Cook to Bridge Road. Yeah, the actual location, Maggie. What was the actual location of the traffic counters? Just north of. Okay. Yeah, they, it gets very curvy. Right. Again, up towards the top. Um, I'd be surprised if folks are going 36 on that curve. Yeah. I mean, there's also a curve, you know, in the other direction too. You know, it's kind of, it's kind of almost like an S sort of, right? Yeah. So they both have curves. Yeah. There wasn't any measurement towards the bridge road. The other thing to be aware of is much longer term, but that nursing home, that's the former nursing home at Bridge Road, that's been on the market now for five years, however long it's been, um, you know, almost certain, someday it's going to sell, and almost certainly we're going to want them to address that intersection. That's what I'd say. Whether that means just closing their curbs on Bridge Road, using their side entrances, or physically investing the intersection, I'm not sure. But, mm -hmm. Okay. And um, in terms of, so the, the roundabout to, for a vehicle to go through that, how, how fast would they be going? At 25 miles there. Which is a lot slower than most of them when they're entering Hatfield Street okay. now. People are like, That's they're buzzing good. along at 40 and yeah. they're still doing 40. So this should, that project should really yeah. slow things down yeah. for that. Can I ask a question? Yes. Um, what about, I, I love the idea of the striping. That's going to help, I think. What about this, there's a 30 mile per hour sign at each end, which you can barely see. They're very old signs, They're kind of hanging out there in the, in the woods, both of them. Is there any way we can have better sign, signage for how many miles per hour? Because nobody sees them. Yeah, we can, we can take a look at these location yeah. of the signs like get um, them and the retroflectivity yeah of them. yeah so people could yeah not that they're going to pay attention to them. yeah we'll take we'll take a look at but it. the roundabout will make a big difference it's a scary experience living in pine's edge condominiums we all are very wary at the bottom of the hill and we always tell all our guests don't think that's a normal intersection you're taking your life in your hands stop look both ways look left last because that's where they're coming in it's pretty scary and they can be coming fast either way, because even from Bridge Road, you know, I almost got hit the other day. It was just like, whoa, where'd that come from? Because they're coming up a hill, too. So if they're coming really fast, you don't see them. So, um. And I can introduce you. This is Kim Gerald, who um, spearheaded the, the application. So thanks for coming. Thank you. So, um, so we'll add, we'll look at, along with the striping, maybe some new speed limit signs that are a little perky or looking. Yeah, okay, we'll see, over the years, the uh, retroflectivity, you know, can wear. Right. Um, and, and, you know, if they are leaning um, or otherwise not appropriately visible, mm -hmm. we can. One has graffiti across it, the one by Bridge Road. I'm just trying to figure out what it said, but something funny, I think. All right. Yeah, we'll take a look at it. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, discussion of the TESPO letter. So uh, TESPO, who's on the planning board and also um, has a business on Pleasant Street, uh, Beehive Sewing, um, uh, several months ago, she had a customer, an uh, older customer, uh, who went out to put money in the meter and slipped and fell. Um, the, this individual got up and tried to do it again and slipped and fell because there was uh, all of the snow around the, um, the, the parking meter and she, 
the, the customer was not able to access it safely. So that's what prompted Tess's letter. And um, in the letter, she made a number of recommendations. Let me see if I can pull them up here. Okay, we'll talk about this Google Drive in a minute. Um, so she made some suggestions to us that we add shuffling the area around the meter to the ordinance that requires building owners to shovel sidewalks after snowstorms, um, empower parking meter attendants with the enforcement power to issue citations to building owners, uh, add shuffling the meters to the city's responsibilities as part of uh, as part and parcel of plowing. Um, during and after snow emergencies, implement revised meter enforcement operations that are sensitive to accessibility and lack of payment options. Um, so those are those were the bigger suggestions that she had. Um, any ideas on how people think we should move forward with this. Well, the good news is that we now have an app, so uh, people don't actually have to access the machine. Um, I understand that everyone's comfortable using them, but right. that is an additional option. So I think this is in a spot where we have the old meters. So down yeah, on... No, but even the meters should have um, mm -hmm. you know, a zone mm -hmm. number on it that you can use that. Really? Every meter, every metered area in the city where you have to pay to park mm -hmm. has a designation, a zone designation. Um, and that zone designation, the sticker, a brake green sticker, you've probably seen them, um, is on every meter and every pay kiosk. Um, and that's the one that you use with the app. And so all the person has to do is put in the zone number, how much time they want to park, and then their car. And they should be able to see the sticker from inside their car. Yes. Right. Well, it seems we've already solved this. <laughs> uh, David, I know you're rolling out more of those sort of the, those bigger, whatever these things are called, pay kiosks. Multi space station. Thank you. Is Pleasant Street part of that plan or not yet? Uh, not this phase. Okay. Um, so, what we're looking at is uh, probably Crafts Avenue this year. Um, one on each side of Main Street between uh, King Street and Pleasant Street heading back up towards uh, the lights here. And then one under each side of the trestle light path. So probably at least, probably six this year. And then we'll do another round. Interesting. Any so the current ordinance um, about shoveling the sidewalks, I believe, already extends to the curb, doesn't it? It probably does, although there's nowhere for people to put the snow, so that's kind of the conundrum is we have an ordinance that prevents people from snowing, throwing snow into the street, so then you just have someone sitting there to shovel the snow and nowhere to put it. <laughs> Except around the meters. Yeah, but, th <laughs> but there could be a way, I mean, the meters are spaced out, so there could be a way to just require them to make like a little shovel path to each meter. Right, that's been the standard procedure is that you may not be able to shovel all the way around every single standalone meter, but you'll notice that there are cut throughs um, that have been made. And the person may have to walk a little bit down to that cut through to come back up to the sidewalk, should then, which should be shoveled. Um, but it's not like you have to walk a whole block to get to that um, cut through. And where you put the money is on the building side. So, and that's the sidewalk that should be shoveled by the um, business, if it's a business. Part of it could be an educational issue if, if Tess has issues with this again and sees that they're blocked, she could call us and our officer would go down and then educate the property owner and say, hey, you got to shovel so that people can access the meters. Okay. And parking enforcement, um, the officers 
do often report um, unshoveled areas um, along the you know Main Street and Pleasant and that sort of thing, um, and that's passed on to the police department so that they can then do their appropriate follow-up. Um, also, parking enforcement um, does um, go with the the policy of if if a, a person if it's obvious that a person will not be able to safely get to that meter then that ticket is not going to happen. I mean, there's a safety issue here, too, um, and common sense that well, that's you're not going to expect someone to scale a bank of ice and snow to get to a meter. Well, that was one of the things that Tess talked about was this person got a ticket. So, so um, she could um, make a case for having that ticket waived. Well, that's the thing. I I don't know. I I looked into this when the when the letter came through, mm -hmm. and I have pictures of you know every every ticket that's issued has pictures associated with it that the officer will take of the area and of the violation. Um, and I looked at what could potentially have been those the vehicles that that were involved with this ticket and. Um, it's hard to tell one way or the other whether it's her vehicle or not, or that person's vehicle, because I don't have all of that information. Mm -hmm. It wasn't presented in the letter. So, you know, there were a number of tickets that were issued that day during, you know, during a particular time period. Um, so I, I'm just not sure which vehicle it was. Um, so this individual should, should probably come down and talk to you. Or yeah, to they, the well, if anyone that is that receives a parking ticket can appeal that ticket at any time if they have any questions um, i urge them to to appeal the ticket or to contact the parking office um, to ask the questions that that they may have and find out um, what their options are as far as appealing the ticket um, it just has to be a you know, a, an appeal in writing, and it can be done online, um, and they'll get an email response back, or it can be done in, in writing I'll, with a letter just sent to the parking office. The person does not have to appear at that initial stage of the uh, appeal. It's a simple written appeal, and the hearing officer will review the circumstances surrounding that ticket, and then um, respond in writing to that person. So yeah, I, I urge anyone who um, wants to appeal a ticket to please go ahead and do that. That's what the hearing officer is there for, is to review that ticket. So, um, so the actions that we're considering taking here are, you know, I, I could contact Tess about letting this individual know she could appeal her ticket. Um, do we? see any need to change the the ordinance as written or well and it, and it also when the dpw puts out the the alert um they do have on that please remember that residents and businesses are responsible for clearing sidewalks bordering their property so um the information is being put out there mm -hmm. it's whether or not you know the person the business owner or whomever is, is actually following the And there is a, um, a telephone number on every parking meter and on every pay station um, for the meter hotline um, that they can call that number and report that there's a problem with that meter whatever it may be, whether it's mechanical, snow around it, whatever, or they can call directly to the parking office um, and we will follow up on it. And the maintenance supervisor reviews all of those messages to the hotline continuously throughout the day. Mm -hmm. So the recommendation is to do nothing at this time? I would respond to Tess and just, you know, Tell, tell her about the things that we talked about, the app. And the that, app and, and, the, and that she should call, and it's, you know, feel free to call if she feels like well, this is being violated. Well, so after all, it is winter <coughs> in New England, and 
sometimes you step into a snowbank if you want to get access to the parking area. Right. I would just, you know, urge people not to just try to scale up over. I, I don't know what the circumstances were here, and I'm not saying that this is what this individual did, but you know, go to where the cut through is, um, and then get up onto the sidewalk. I'm not trying to scale over top of the snowbank. Sometimes after big storms, it can be, you know, I mean, I'm very able, and I've definitely had to had a hard time getting them sometimes because there's just, sure. as, as the chief said, there's a lot of snow and nowhere to put it. So it's, you know, they should feel empowered to to call, I guess, to the police department, the non-emergency number. Absolutely. All right. Well, I will communicate with Tess around these so points can here. Sorry. Say that again? Sorry. That's all right. All right. Um, so on to the next thing. Uh, discussion of the 25 mile an hour speed limit education plan. So, um, so as you, you people are aware that there is a proposed idea to accept from the state the 25 mile an hour speed limit um, for areas where the speed limit is not posted. And um, I mean, that's kind of like this mixed thing of like, you know, where you don't know how fast to drive, you should be driving 25. And that, um, and that if we put up a sign, we're actually kind of in violation of the idea of an unposted speed limit. So um, in discussions with uh, DPW, and with the mayor, um, Councilor O'Donnell and I, um, we, we came to a, the agreement that the, the best way forward on uh, accepting uh, this, this order is to, um, to, put, to com put together some sort of education plan. That, um, you know, rather than just, you know, having the city ad adopt a 25 mile an hour speed limit, that we really need to educate everybody ahead of time. And um, that, um, so when meeting with Councilor O'Donnell and, and, and the mayor, they both kind of looked at me as the chair of the TPC as the person to come up with the plan. So, um, and in that role, I was thinking, well, who would be best from our, um, uh, our group here to help put together that plan? Um, and I was thinking this is a great opportunity for the citizen members to um, be part of uh, to bring their ec expertise as you know members of the public into um, the process here. So I've reached out to a number of the, the the citizen members here. I know that Krista is interested as well as Gary, and um, and I thank you. Um, I understand that other members are a little bit too busy at this time, and I thank you for considering. Uh, is there anybody I missed who might want to join us? Um, so, the idea is that um, that we would create a subcommittee of this committee that would meet outside of, have a public meeting outside of the TPC, so the rest of you don't have to attend. We'll put together a plan, and uh, we'll bring it back here for your your approval, much the way that Wayne came today with the idea of you know, the open, the open space plan. And, um, and then that would, then would be implemented by the city, possibly by us too. Depending on what we come up with. I mean, some of the ideas were like, you know, a letter to the editor, you know, that could be written by a number of us. Um, but um, that gets into the plan which hasn't been developed yet. So. What, what, I, what I'd like to do today is to make a motion to form a subcommittee to uh, create an education plan for the 25 mile an hour speed limit. And um, can I get a second on that? Second. Um, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? And the, and just to make sure I'm doing this right, <coughs> So, so far, that it, and um, I should probably make a motion as to who's on the committee, right? Yeah, sure. All right, well, uh, so uh, that 
I'd like to make a motion that uh, part of the committee is me and Krista and Gary, and um, that that we will comprise the committee. I okay. second that motion for those representatives as a committee. Okay. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, thank you. Do you have a time frame for this? Well, you know what? Um, I, you know, I, in in my mind, I'd like to be rolling this out by the fall. I mean, I, in the best of all worlds, I would love to have it in place. You know, the rollout date is the start of school, something like that. You know, or at some point that. Um, uh, marks an event in the fall calendar so um just sorry. a quick comment if if i or the dpw can provide any uh, technical assistance during your process please let us know thank you um any other questions or okay all right we've done the hatfield street all right, parking zone change for Hooker Avenue. Meg. So, uh, I'm going to know there's a new parking form up on the city website that people can just fill that out rather than going through emails or written letters. You just fill out the form, and it'll come to the with the toe was the sign was less than the the reflectivity that you discussed I think had lessened on the sign and it was a guest of the residence in the park there. I think most of the signs were faded there yeah and yeah the residents are you more aware that there was an ordinance there but <laughs> mm -hmm. I couldn't read it so 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 we we're, we're voting or we're, um, we want to give a positive rec recommendation to remove all of these parking restrictions. It would still be no parking on the King Street side. So okay. At the entrance of the street. But okay. To the dead end, they are allowed to park overnight. Great. And Adam Novit, who got this started, was. Um, I think he called you today, didn't he? He called a number of us, and um, yeah, so that's exactly what he would like to say. So, um, so all in favor of a positive? Wait, so yeah. So, there's no parking on one side of the street ever, or is there just in a section? Just in the section at King Street. And is there um, and is there room if people are parked on both sides? So this is my only question that I'll add is I believe the reason that vehicle got towed is because we, there's a, a place here we go frequently so with ambulances as well and it was winter time so the snow banks had uh, two cars had parked on both sides of the street so the snow banks had pushed them out and then the, then the ambulance couldn't get through so I think that's why it was towed original it wasn't just like some random let's tow on Hooker Avenue today I think there was an issue with emergency vehicles so that's my only concern is but do we know if that's Gonna be an issue. This is closing no parking. You're not allowed to park from eleven to five AM, so that's only counting overnight. People are allowed to park during the day on both sides of the street. We haven't heard any issues about that. So that's not Okay. I'm always reluctant to change things if we don't know the reason why they were implemented in the first place. Um Nancy, you don't have any historical knowledge of it. 
Mm. And you're saying in the winter, if people are parked on both sides, an ambulance is it's tough for them just, to get Well, through? just once. Like, just that's once, why right. a car was towed. And right. maybe, maybe, maybe the snow could be pushed back a little more or maybe we had a lot of snow one time I don't know but that's not historically a problem on the street I just know in that one instance that's why that car was towed it was too tight do they need parking on both sides of the street or could you just give them parking on one side of the street to always leave no parking on the other side at those times well as Maggie pointed out I think they can park on both sides of the street now right all day all day, During the day. yeah so just not at night just not at night which is odd yeah when people are home <laughs> right right, right. <laughs> <laughs> in this residential neighborhood. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, during snow emergencies, you're not allowed to park anything. Anyway. Because of the power operation. Yeah. 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 I think it's post plowing, though, that the parking issue occurred. I don't think it's going to be a major issue. But it just, I just know in that one instance that's what that was about. So, mm -hmm. as long as drivers on the street are cognizant, or I don't know. As long as I guess the plow drivers know that they have to clear it really close to the sides. So, any more discussion? Sorry. Go ahead and do it. This. It's just 11 p.m. to 5 a.m. Is, is up. Like, we don't have, I can't think of other places where we have those times. We usually, it's, right, it's like 11.59 to 6 a.m. So, everything about this is a little strange and makes me wonder why it's that way. There, there must have been a reason for this. Where we have no other, no other place in the code group that it's that time. But nobody remembers why. <clears throat> and it goes back to 1986. Was there a business? Any businesses down there? I mean, there's the fire or the tire place there. What was there before that? Because typically that kind of ordinance would be in place to prevent people who don't live there from leaving cars there overnight, right? I mean, that's what that kind of ordinance usually exists for. But I don't see what's around that, that that would occur. And you're also with that Right. So maybe there was a problem with a car dealership parking on the street and taking up all of the residential spaces, or and this forced them off the street at night? And we've spoken to one resident and the other residents that we've spoken to about this. The resident has spoken to the And they asked two people from that street had filled up for the same thing. Okay. <laughs> Ready? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, Somebody want to make a motion for a positive recommendation for this change in parking? So moved. Second that. Okay. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Uh, any no's? Any abstentions? Okay, thank you. Uh, let's see. Parking zone change for Vernon Street. Back to you, Meg. So on Vernon Street, this is the, the resident that came in at the last meeting during all the comments. Correct, all right. So, so from, if people were parked on both sides of the street, they had difficulty getting past Jewish Street on Vernon. So they are requesting that there is no parking on the eastern side of Vernon between Elm and Vernon. make that so that it's only through the winter months just to save that parking in the summer because it's just for snow banks right I just that's a big parking right a lot of people are always trying to park in that area so just a way to free up parking for an extra right. six months I'm not sure how many people actually park here because it's a large curve cut um, yeah. I think like there's painted parking spaces up there and the high school is always parked on the I don't want to make 
something weird. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> Are Smith students um, prohibited from parking in any way? Because I know a lot of those streets have different, you know, all sorts of parking times. You can't park there to keep students from taking up parking. And this is right up by the high school. Yeah. Yeah, two blocks right east. So, uh, any more discussion? Um, does anybody want to make a motion for a positive recommendation for this change on Vernon Street? So moved. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Forgot the discussion part, right? Oh well. All right. So on to the next thing. Discussion regarding provision of documents associated with the TPC agenda for commission members. So this is just to say that um, in talking with Beth, who, does, who right now is providing us a lot of administrative support, um, was hoping that, you know, if, if people need documents, if you could let her know ahead of time and she will print up pack, packets for everybody, but also at the same time um, that um, she is uh, working hard to make the entire packet available uh, online so you can look at it the way you know I am and Councillor Shara is right now or you can you know at home you can print up exactly whatever it is you want um, but the idea is to move away from the, the, the idea that we're going to provide packets for everybody if you need one let let us know give us fair warning can I make a recommendation or sure. a request could we, like, how Tess's letter is linked in the agenda, could mm -hmm. we link all the documents like we do with the council agenda? That way you just, you know, you can pull them up much faster. I will talk to Beth about that. I just have one comment. Um, sure. So we we pay by the copy um, when we photocopy. That's that's sort of the, the contract that we have um, with our photocopier vendor. So for every piece of paper we're generating, there's an expense to the DPW that that we have to support. So if we're if we're providing packets that are this thick to everyone in this room, that's I mean, that's actually like a quantifiable expense. So um, that's that's one of the other reasons for this request. Good to know. Mm. Thank you for working on making yeah. this more accessible for us. Well, I credit Beth and the staff at the DPW and, um, and Cindy. They've all been great. Cindy's been really helpful. And Beth, we, we've spent a lot of time getting everything prepared for meetings. And, uh, and it's going to get better. As it has gotten better, you know, with in terms of as Maggie pointed out with the parking request change, that was our first parking request was the Ver Vernon Street, and um, and that went through pretty efficiently. She came here, she filled out the application, it came through. It was next up on our agenda here. Uh, you had a time, you know, time to look at it and put together a proposal. Uh, and Councillor Bidwell was informed that this was going on. So it, it's it's a there's a lot of efficiencies that are going on right now, and um, and we'll start to see them over the next few months. So um, so the last thing is to let everybody know that our next scheduled meeting is for May 15th at 4 p.m. here, and um, and if there's things that people want to add to the agenda, please you know get in touch with me. And, um, and we'll get those things on the agenda. Um, and the subcommittee folks, if I could meet with you right after we adjourn, uh, that would be great. And um, is there any new business? 
move to adjourn. Okay. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you.